Hello and welcome. I'm glad you could join me tonight. We're going to be talking tonight about a kind of medicine that I have not learned much about in all my years, osteopathic medicine. I'm going to be interviewing a family practice doc who specializes in osteopathic medicine. And I'm eager to ply him with questions because I have a lot. And I'm guessing some of you do too, although some of you may have, have taken advantage of working with, with someone in this field. My guest is Dr. Richard Ruby. And uh, your practice is out in Bloomington, correct? That's correct. Um, and you've been doing this, you said, 36 years? 30, 36 years. Yeah. And I still love it. So. And still love it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, not a lot of people can say that after that many years with one job. Well, one of the things I like about it is that uh, I'm always learning new things, which is, for me, is... For me, that's everything. It keeps me interested, and it's fun to learn something new and then work with it with my and patients. And share it and with share your, it. your yeah, patients, exactly. right, yeah. mm -hmm. right. Um, this is probably a naive question, but I don't even know if you consider osteopathic medicine um, a complementary form of medicine or a traditional. It's, it's an interesting question because where osteopathic medicine started was as mostly a, a hands-on manipulation skill. And that changed over time into much more standard medicine. So you'll see a lot of osteopathic physicians who practice medicine like an MD would practice. And then there are a few of us who practice a little more of the older style where we work more with our hands. So. And I, I wanted to, yes, be sure that people understood that from mm -hmm. the, the beginning here that manipulative work is not probably what most osteopath no. docs, docs are doing, right? Not anymore. It's interesting because in, in the schools, you know, part of the training is to learn how to work with your hands. And in the first two years of training, to be an osteopathic school, you have to learn something about that. So it is in part of the curriculum, but almost all, vast majority of my colleagues do standard medicine like an MD would do. So, and that's one of the differences which is very, very strong for yeah, me. that's so. interesting. And when you talk about manipulation, then I think chiropractory mm -hmm. medicine too. Mm -hmm. How does it differ just in a nutshell? The difference is in training and in style. The, you know, chiropractic physicians have a particular type of training. Their licensure is definitely more limited in terms of what they can do. Osteopathic physicians are trained in the full range of medicine, so we're taught in our schooling to do the full thing, you know, dermatology and catching babies and, you know, what have you. So mm -hmm. we get the full medical training that an MD would get, plus we get a little bit extra training in working with some of the manual skills. And the vast majority, like I said, of my colleagues do much more mainstream, you know, MD-type medicine, so at this point. Yeah, okay, that's, that's good to clarify. Osteopathic medicine, you, you told me earlier, um, or the kind you studied at least, came out of France, right? No. No? No, no. They, actually, osteopathy started in, in uh, Missouri, and, you know, the school, first school was opened in 1892, so, and it was a uh, country doctor, uh, who was actually an MD, a Civil War era surgeon who decided to open a school teaching the manual skills, the manual medicine mm -hmm. skills. And so that's when the first school started. It was actually in 1892. So it's a very American system. Oh, okay. and, and then it spread from there virtually all over the world. And it took hold in the European uh, area uh, quite strongly, especially in France, oh, okay. Eng England, and so on. So. So France was in there somewhere, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, some, uh, something I read uh, yeah, confused me. Um, so what are the types of medical problems that, that would be considered mm -hmm. really logical ones for people to say, I really want to try finding an osteopathic doctor? To treat this. The main thing that people come to see an osteopath doing manual medicine for are just basically pain issues. Is so, it? Okay. You know, chronic pain, headaches, car accidents, injuries, that sort of thing. And it's 
there, it's a wide, wide variety of those kinds of situations from chronic pain that's lasted for you know, sometimes decades to more acute pain, such as after a car accident. So. Does it follow that if you don't get treated for pain early on, it's going to be more intractable and harder to absolutely yes harder to get rid of absolutely there are several things which happen one is that if you have an area that's painful you're going to end up using yourself differently so you'll right. you won't use your arm the same you'll use your back differently you start to develop habits which are not helpful <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then you end up creating more problems for yourself down the line so it's mm -hmm. far better to get get things taken care of and make sure that things are cleared up you know as much as is possible body is so interconnected, you know, the it old is. song, the hip bone connected to the, absolutely, <laughs> et cetera. Um, well, I had a good example of that actually today, a, a new patient, a young gal, 18 years old, she had knee pain and she gave me the list of all the different practitioners she'd been to see since December and it was a long, wow. long list and she had a whole raft of diagnoses and what I love about my work is I can put my hands on her knee and put my hands on her back and kind of listen to what's going on in her body. And you know, it's a very different way to work than looking at an image or, you know, or you know, with an x-ray or an MRI or something like that and actually feeling something with your hands. So, so tell me more about that. So by, by placing your hand on the knee and the back, you're getting signals that her body is giving off that guide you in terms of yes. making some adjustments? Well, what happened with, with this, for instance, with this gal. Yeah, it's a great example, probably. Yeah, I, I put my hands on the area of her knee that was bothering her. There's a nerve that runs right through there. When I slipped my hand under her back and I just touched that area where the nerve was, I could feel on the other end, I could feel that that nerve was where it came from and the back was quite irritated. And if so you, what did it feel like? What is that? We actually is feel it tighter a, or yeah, it's harder? kind of it, actually if you press on it, you can feel it's almost like a pinging. <laughs> you feel a, a sense oh, of really? yeah, you feel just a sense of connection, and and if you pull on one end, you can feel it tugging on the other end, and it's so you know that that area, this is where the problem is, and uh -huh. and then if you work that open, you will often get a relief in the pain. So, and in her case, she, is it something you? have a sense of relief right away or does it, it come? It, it can be right away. Can yeah. it? And uh, I see her, she's a student and at college away from here. So I'm gonna see her again Friday. We'll see how she fares in one uh -huh. week's time. So uh -huh. usually it takes a little longer than five days to clear up something that's been around for a while right, like I that. Would but think. we'll see what happens. Yeah. So in terms of chronic pain, you don't discourage people though from coming who might have had pain, let's say, so many people have back pain, mm -hmm. back pain for, for years, mm -hmm. you still could probably or maybe help them, right? Possibly, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's worth a try. It's one of those things, I tell my, I tell my patients, well, let's, let's do two, three visits, you'll have some idea if I can get at this in two or three visits, and you know, we'll have some sense of what's changed and what's possible mm -hmm. here. And, you know, if people are willing to do their homework, you know, exercise, stretching, you know, possibly change their diet or whatever is needed, then there's a pretty good chance they'll have some improvements. So. Speaking of diet, and maybe we can come back to pain too, but something I read on your website was um, important and intriguing, and I wanted to, mm -hmm. to ask you about the connection between mm -hmm. sugar, white sugar, yeah. and pain, because you said some pretty strong things about that connection. And yes. I was in, interested. So I'll tell you a small story. I worked with a woman, this was probably uh, 25 years ago, something like that, chronic left hip pain. And it was her left hip, left low back. And I worked on her and her tissue was really s sort of thick and it felt tough, like it was just not very, it should be soft and mm, okay, so sort not of, very pliable. Not very pliable, exactly. Mm. And I would work on her, she would get better, she'd come back, she would be worse again, and she'd get better. I, <laughs> this went back and forth a few times. I finally said to her, look, do you need to stop eating sugar? I didn't see her for six months. She came back after six months. She said, well, I stopped eating sugar. The pain went away completely. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's hurting again. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, I started eating sugar again. Oh, gosh. I said, well, she that... didn't need to come back. So I she? said, well, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. Stop eating sugar. But what was interesting was when I put my hands on her, on that area that was hurting, it was so soft, so pliable compared to before, mm. with little islands of pain in there where she was having some trouble again. And um, so for me, it was really, that was the clearest, most direct uh, expression of what sugar can do on the body if you get it in excess. So, in so, excess. In excess. So, what is it about sugar? I mean, does it cause inflammation, or it can cause inflammation? Uh, my own sense of it is that it um, tends to make tissue somewhat sticky, and mm -hmm. uh, actually, in full-blown diabetes, where people have a great deal of trouble handling the sugar. Uh, there's a measure we do called hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of sugar being sticky with hemoglobin. Well, the same process happens any, pl any place in the body, including the soft tissue, muscles, connective tissue, and you can feel that with your hands. Mm. And I can almost always tell immediately when I touch somebody if they have an issue with eating too, too much. Too much sugar. Either too much sugar or just not being able to handle you know, carbohydrates generally, so. And there's often a continuum of yes. responses, isn't there, to yeah. any yeah. any variable? Yeah. Um, what about honey? What about brown sugar? I mean, so many people in our country. Yeah. It's a matter of quantity, you know. Is it quantity more than it's type quantity. of sugar? Well, you know, in 1900, an average person ate about maybe four pounds of refined sugar per year, and now it's close to 150 pounds per Is person that per right? year and somebody's eating my share. <laughs> you're not, you're I, not. I don't eat that much. <laughs> yeah. So, um, small oh my gosh, are, four pounds in 1900 yeah. and the average now is 150 pounds. Yeah. What made the big difference going from Prime, food we grew ourselves yeah. on the, you yeah, know, essentially, farm, yeah. et cetera? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's Kind a lot of, of it shocking. is a lot of it is the high fructose corn syrup, and mm -hmm. so many people drink. So you see the 16 ounce or 24 ounce whatever jugs of whatever cola. It's just loaded yeah. with sugar. So even like in a can of Pepsi or Coke, they're like 23 teaspoons of sugar. It's or about something? Thir about 13 per. Is it 13? Per little, yeah, but okay. that's a lot of sugar. That's a lot of sugar. I mean. We'd never put that much sugar on a bowl of cereal or, right. or you know, right. anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, there's also, you know, we hear about white sugar, white flour, and cancer in the, some mm. connection. So would you agree there, that that is I, something I th to avoid I, for, I think that there's, for that condition too? I think there's been some associations that have been found. It's, I wouldn't go so far as to say, if you eat sugar, you're going to get cancer. That's no, a little strong, no. but uh, you know, it's a matter of context and you know, having small amounts occasionally, I, it's okay. Sure. You know, but to eat it as a regular, you know, my own philosophy about food is eat real food. You know, eat real food, that's simple, so. Are you also um, a proponent of organic food? I am, very much so. Mm -hmm. There have been some concerning research studies lately, though, that maybe we can't totally trust that organic is organic, and mm -hmm. it's, it's confusing to me sometimes to think, oh, how are we going to really make good informed decisions? You have to know your companies, and you have to know your source, and it helps to know farmers, and that's uh, not always an easy thing, but I think on the whole, if you're buying organic food, you're probably better off than buying something whose names you can't pronounce. So, Yeah, I mean, some of the chemicals yeah, that, you read that labels are put and, in the yeah, food. Yeah. Um, you wrote something that I, I wanted to ask you to, to explain because I thought it was really intriguing. You wrote that the body generally knows what it needs to do to heal itself. Yes. Tell us more about what you mean by that, Dr. Ruby? Okay. You know, there's a process in all of our bodies where we try to maintain balance. We try to maintain, the term is homeostasis. It's basically, it's uh, 
when we get sick, we come back to some semblance of balance. When, when we injure ourselves, our body figures out a way to get us back towards wholeness. And that's essentially what I depend on as a practitioner, because if the person didn't have that internal sense of what normal, what health, what balance is, I would have a really, really hard time doing my work. Mm -hmm. I depend on that, so. So how can we become more in tune? What, what do we look for in our own lives that I think can I, I give mean, us either red flags yeah. or, or go yeah. signs, you know? Yeah. I mean, red flags for me would be chronic tension. If you're, if you're physically tense in different parts of your body, it, there's a reason for that. You know, if we're sitting too much, if we're, you know, doing activities that harm us, it, it, our body tells us very clearly. And if we are uh, astute and pay attention and listen to our bodies, it's, we'll, we will we'll do much better than if we ignore that and try to, try to you know, push through and so mm -hmm. on. So, and the other things too is you listen to how you feel. If you're feeling foggy in your head, it's like there might be something that you're doing that isn't working very well for you. And it could be dietary, it could be when you eat, how you eat, the attitude that you take when you into when you eat. You know, there are lots of different reasons why people, you know, just don't feel good on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I think too a lot of people get in habits and then get so used to not feeling great yes. that that becomes the norm almost. Yes. And so what does it take to wake up a person, do you think, to realize that yeah. I don't want to feel so-so the rest of my life? It really helps to have a snapshot of a time when you felt pretty good. And that uh, is, you know, finding that place where you feel happy and you feel good in yourself and so on, it's I, that's a, sometimes a hard thing to do, but I think that most of us can look back and find... See, that's a... Yeah. But you know, the tricky thing with that is, I think when I think of comments people make to me, friends and colleagues, they often say, well, I don't feel like I used to, and they think it's, and, and probably some of it is, related to aging. Right. And so then they kind of, I think, are feeling, well, there's not much I can do about that. It's just part of getting older. But are you saying we don't have to? Not necessarily. I mean, aging is real, but I have a small story. I had an old guy in my practice. He was probably in his, oh, he, I think he was in his 80s, actually. And he had a shoulder problem. And he said he went to his doctor. And the doctor said, well, you have arthritis. And it's like, OK, that's an easy thing to say to somebody who's 80. And right. I worked on his shoulder. <laughs> came back the next time. He says, yeah, I can throw a ball again. <laughs> ah. You know, it's like age doesn't have to be right. necessarily. Yeah, that's kind of what I've, you know, so. I've thought, too, that that we put a little too much blame on aging. It's an easy thing to reach mm -hmm. towards, and I, I don't think it's a good idea. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's not necessary, so. It's neat to have older people ahead of us that we can look to that are great models. Yeah. But there aren't a lot out there, but mm -hmm. there are some. There are a few. I want to go back to talking about some of the other, or I want to ask you about some of the other kinds of conditions mm -hmm. that someone could uh, seek out osteopathic and specifically manipulative mm -hmm. uh, medicine for pain is a big one. It may be mm -hmm. the biggest. But what other kinds of things do you help people with? Oh, there's a very, very long list of different sorts of things. If, you, if an area is in the body is not having good circulation, you can have all kinds of symptoms that go with that. For instance, uh, if you're having trouble with chronic tension in your in your abdomen, for instance, you might have problems with your stomach function. So working on working on the abdomen, you can release that and get some freedom there, and mm -hmm. person might feel better. You can have a woman with bladder problems, and you work on the lower abdomen a bit with your hands, get things straightened out there, and the frequency and urgency and even incontinence can go away. Just mm -hmm. it depends. Uh, Obviously not always, but sometimes. And mm -hmm. You can have a newborn baby that's spitting, spitting up frequently and having some vomiting issues and so on. You work a little bit on their upper neck, base their skull area. 
that mm -hmm. will clear up for them sometimes. And it's mm -hmm. there are lots of different kinds of things that are not pain related necessarily. Mm -hmm. People who have breathing problems where they have a hard time, excuse me, getting a full deep breath, you can work on the rib cage and have some nice change and mm -hmm. help them to breathe more fully and more, you know, so. All kinds of things. And maybe an umbrella connective thing here is tension in that part of the body that's yes. causing yeah, tension those yeah, kinds poor, of problems. Yeah, poor circulation, basically. Mm -hmm. if, if an area is tight, it's not going to be, the term I use is not happy in here. It's, yeah, it's, it yeah, needs, that makes it sense. needs to move better, it needs to breathe better. You know, the physical, the parts of the body that are stuck, and I, I just work with my hands to try to you know, get things moving better. And Do so. you find other doctors, internists, and other family practice doctors are using the kind of skills you have by referring? Yes. Saying, you know, I've got a patient that I just don't, we're not getting anywhere, do you want to try? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing? Yeah, I get referrals from, from PTs, from MDs, from DOs, from chiropractors and others who are, you know. Yeah, I've, that's you know, good. Lots that's of different good. variety of people. Massage therapists, obviously, and, uh -huh. you know, Pilates people, <laughs> whatever. Well, so. yeah, it's always great to say as a professional, I'm not sure, let's try someone yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, I think patients respect that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, osteoporosis, just real quickly, we only have a few minutes left. Um, you have some thoughts on that, I know, regarding mm -hmm. the connection with both diet and exercise. Yes. And the number of people that have osteopenia and then osteoporosis is yeah. pretty big in our yeah. country. One of the interesting things with that is I wanted to write a paper about that simply because uh, I have a lot of people asking that question. And so I did some basic research in the physiology text to see what was going on. A lot of it was about nutrition having to do with protein metabolism. And so I started thinking about a lot of my people with osteopenia, osteoporosis have problems with you know, getting enough protein, having the protein digest properly, having the proper nutrients to absorb calcium and magnesium and silica and the other minerals that are needed. So, mm -hmm. so I talk to people about that and, and um, get them exercising so that they're actually using their bones so their body kind of gets it that they need to actually build enough strengthen the bones to manage so things. So some weight, li weight lifting and yeah. walking and walking, things where yeah. you're... Stretching just, even will pushing, help. Pushing the bone yeah. strength. Mm -hmm. um, so the amount of protein though you, you think is crucial in terms of bone mm -hmm. density, bone repairing itself. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it needs a certain amount of protein and more importantly we need to actually digest it and a lot of times you'll I'll see people who are on acid blocking drugs and if you have an acid blocking drug in your system you're not going to digest your food very well mm -hmm. and and um, so what are a couple of the common acid oh nexium and you know that sort of thing the okay. you know the all the ones that are over the even over the counter now you can the ones for heartburn basically mm, and okay they basically stop your body from digesting they protein do. okay know, and um, not good <laughs> yeah so so if you have, if you're taking some of those drugs, and if you have osteoporosis or mm. osteopenia, you might want to think about it. Think about, you know, obviously, if you're taking more protein or yeah, if you're having trouble with reflux, obviously you have to manage that. That's not a good thing to have either. So there's some balance there that has to be made. So um, we just have a couple minutes left now, but there's a osteopathic school going to be yes. um, started here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Did you say 2020 or 2021? I think their first class will be, it looks like 2020. Okay. And that'll be out in Gaylord, and, and uh, which is a, out in the west from Twin Cities area. Yeah, and, south uh, and west of it. Yeah, yeah. And um, as far as I know, they're, they're probably going to have their first class in 2020. They have the dean, they have the place, they have everything ready to go, so. Okay, and when, when you first told me Gaylord, I was like, Gaylord, yeah. <laughs> you know, but Why? you made yeah. the really important point that we need more doctors out state. Yes. 
And I mean, that's not just Minnesota issue, is yes, it? Yes, yes, exactly. And that's one of the things with the osteopathic profession is we, about 45% of DOs are family practice type doctors. So it's family mm -hmm. medicine doctors. So internists, pediatricians, you know, general practitioners and so on. And, uh, you know, that's a real uh, strong need. And, um, you know, the osteopathic schools often will graduate many more of those types of practitioners. So. Yeah, that's, that's a really a, a, a good thing mm -hmm. to think of getting, getting more help out there because mm -hmm. it's, it's a real um, important part of quality of life. If you're living out state and love it but don't have good medical care, yes. that's a real yes. dilemma, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What would you say, Richard, and we've just got a minute left, to a young person listening who's maybe in college or high school even and thinking about, maybe I'd like to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. What would you say at this time of medicine and with all the crazy reimbursement issues and stuff, what would you say to that I'd say person? Go, I'd say go for it. <laughs> I, but, uh -huh. I, I love what I do. and. You know, for me, medicine has just been a lot of fun. I really enjoy helping people, and um, it's a, a wonderful career. If you have the heart, you know, for it, it's a really good thing to do. Well, that's a great endorsement. You yeah. know, I, I um, think it's so hard for young people nowadays to decide to take on a big career in terms of expense and years. Yeah. Um, but yeah. if, if mm. you end up loving it like you did, and you were in college four years, medical school four years, an internship one year, and yep. didn't do you in, right? No. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Well, thank you so much for coming thank down you. And, yes. and helping me learn more about this. And I'm sure uh, mm. the viewers, too, a lot of them are, are saying, oh, I'm glad I, I uh, got to know more about good. osteopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.